Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar series. The topics that we discuss on these webinars are pertinent to beef, sheep, and goat producers. Tonight's webinar is presented by Dr. Paul Nylon, and he is discussing infectious diseases causing abortion in sheep. Really looking forward to this one. So just a refresher um, or a bit of um, direction if you haven't come to a webinar before. This is your control panel and it should be at the top of your screen. There is a red arrow on the left of this uh, control panel that collapses and reinstates it. You should be able to hear us, but we cannot hear you. So please type your questions throughout the presentation in the box provided. Please make your questions as succinct as possible, and I will relay them to Paul at the end of the webinar. So tonight, as I said, we are joined by Dr. Paul Nylon. Sorry, I don't have a picture of you there, Paul. <laughs> Paul is a sheep and beef vet and production advisor in Tasmania, where he's been working there for the last 30 years. He is, graduate, he is a graduate of the McKinnon Project and a mem member of the Australian College of Vet Scientists in Epidemiology. Paul's special interests are in livestock health and production, particularly in beef and sheep nutrition on pasture, supplementary feeding, grazing systems, and increasingly grazing under irrigation. So we welcome Paul tonight and I will just Swap over and make him presenter. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, unless I hear Hillary swearing from Wagga, I presume that we're up and going. That's good, Paul. So good. E good. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Uh, I hope you're all done in good and they've had lots of rain, send some our way, please. Okay, so um, I preface the uh, tonight's seminar with, with two comments. The first is that unfortunately it is fairly information dense. Um, and so if there are any confusing points, uh, send in a question and we'll, we'll try and set, uh, set them straight. The second comment I'd pass is that, um, this seminar really should be called, you know, what we think we know uh, about uh, fetal loss and abortion in sheep rather than what we do know, because there's still a huge number of uh, gaping holes. And from this, it follows that, that uh, in fact, as vets, we get super excited about, uh, uh, you know, getting a diagnosis of, uh, in the case of a frank abortion, but in reality, uh, the biggest source of loss, in fact, are these um, uh, fetal and uh, embryonic losses that uh, in some cases are not, we're not even aware of. But it, uh, I think because of scanning um, and uh, people keeping better figures, we are becoming more and more aware of it, but we certainly don't have all of the answers. Hopefully, uh, Caroline Jacobson and her team in Western Australia and others will sort out some of these issues in the next few years. Okay, so let's get into it. So we're going to start with a few introductory comments. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, how do you know you've got a problem. Uh, the next section deals with Campylobacter and Toxoplasmosis, which are the big two when it comes to both fetal loss and, um, and uh, frank abortion, or at least we presume they are. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, a few, very briefly about a few other causes and then we'll, we'll sum up. Right, let's go forward. Oh, that's a good start, our things are out of order. So until scanning was widespread, uh, background losses were rarely even noticed, unless you were one of those really diligent people that did the, uh, the wet and drying, did not lamb at lamb marking. And <clears throat> mostly, in fact, people did that to find out um, which ewes hadn't reared because of the repeatability of rearing failure. But what we're finding now, in fact, is uh, increasing numbers of people are commenting on the fact that they scanned, uh, you know, 90% of the lambs, 90% uh, of the sheep in lamb. But in fact, when it came to marking, there was, it's obvious, or even before marking, it was obvious that there were lots that uh, had never lambed at all. And so there's always this issue of background loss. Um, and 
while we are increasingly aware of the perinatal losses due to weather predation and all those sort of things, uh, mismothering, poor lactation, uh, it's almost certain that abortions and embryonic loss are a bit of a sleeper. Uh, and it's only been in recent times that we've started to investigate it. So the things that we're, uh, we're looking for are higher than, ex higher than expected scanned uh, in lamb, but didn't lamb. I'm sorry, that's a mistake there we've got there. Um, differences between uh, what is scanned and what is marked, which is sometimes when we first become uh, uh, aware of it. And occasionally we get frank abortions. Okay, so um, I guess the starting point is that in the high rainfall areas, at least, that we should be scanning better than 93% in lamb uh, from our adult use. So by adults, we mean sort of uh, three-year-olds uh, in Merino enterprises and uh, two-year-olds in the prime lamb enterprises that lamb as one-year-olds. Uh, maidens are more variable, but uh, most, of, uh, most of the clients down here are getting between uh, 75% uh, for one-year-old crossbreds, up to about 95% in lamb, 85% uh, for a two-year-old, provided they're not droughted or otherwise compromised. The thing to keep in mind is after the first three to four weeks, the pregnancy should be really robust. So in fact, there should be only a small variation between what is scanned in lamb and what actually lambs. Um, and increasingly people are looking for obviously empty use at the pre-lamb treatments. So uh, if you manage to stumble across that or uh, you know, you, you're alerted to, to it in one way or the other, uh, start thinking about getting some serological tests done, which we'll talk about further down the track. Uh, for others, unfortunately, it comes as a bit of a rude surprise at marking. So in the high rainfall areas, uh, I know that there are lots of other high rainfall areas apart from Tasmania, it's just that we like to think we rule the world. Um, we work on uh, between 17 and 20, 22% losses in twins due to environment, mismothering, um, and all of those sorts of causes, and nine to thirteen percent in singles. You know, and that's going to be dependent on on the breed, the weather, body condition, and other um, extenuating circumstances. But if in fact you're outside of those sort of loss figures, then you really should start to to look at uh, some underlying cause that is operating um, uh, in advance of the lambing season. And that's even without, or in fact, particularly without any evidence of frank abortions. Um, okay, and finally we'd say get frank abortions investigated. And by frank abortions, obviously, either well in advance of lambing or lambs that uh, are presented obviously small um, during the lambing period. Um, and I say there, you know, if you're getting more than a handful, look, uh, certainly more than about 1% in, in any one mob uh, or more than probably about 10 or 12 across the whole place. So, you know, uh, what, one of the things about trying to act early is that uh, we can occasionally stave off a disaster. Okay, so uh, returning to laboratory testing, uh, for frank abortions, you may be uh, best advised to get your vet involved and submit to a laboratory. So um, you're probably going to need a minimum of about uh, three to four fetuses, preferably with um, placentas as well. Um, and they've got to be fresh. Now, you know, um, time and again, we say to clients, yeah, they've got to be fresh, you know, almost piping hot, but they still seem to submit. Um, fetuses that have had their backsides eaten out by crows or water rats, depending on the tide at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you find them fresh and you need to wait till you get a bit uh, more, uh, a few more before you submit them to the laboratory, you can refrigerate them, but don't freeze them. And if you refrigerate them, I'll let you handle the, all the problems that that may cause with your problem, uh, with your partner, I'm sorry. Now, having said all that, Investigating abortions is an exercise in frustration. So we'll show you some figures from Tasmania shortly, but it shows in fact that uh, one of the highest causes of, of abortion is undiagnosed, not diagnosed. And I think that's pretty much the case worldwide. So 
submitting one manky lamb is uh, not going to give you a result, but even submitting three fresh lambs sometimes fails, uh, fails to come up with an answer. And I'm also aware that uh, in many states, uh, all of this sort of investigation are done by private laboratories. So you do have to watch out uh, that the cost doesn't blow out. We're pretty lucky here in Tasmania that it's capped. So for three or $400, in fact, we can um, submit multiple fetuses uh, and the laboratory is pretty kind to us. And if we don't get the answer first up, then sometimes they say, well, give us a few more. Serology samples, so samples from blood uh, are really useful when there are no frank abortions, but you've noticed a large difference between what has been um, scanned in lamb and what you've marked, or you're finding lots of apparently empty use amongst the scan proportion. So we need to collect at least 10 blood samples um, at pre-lamb treatments, all lamb marking. If you leave it much later than lamb marking, sometimes um, the uh, levels in the blood go down, so we won't get an answer at all. Um, and I routinely recommend that people also get between five and 10 uh, bloods from uh, ewes that have got lambs at foot, just to see if there's any sort of uh, background issues in the mob that can uh, give us a, a specious result. And the place to send them is ACE Laboratories in Bendigo for Toxoplasma and Campy because they're leading the charge in this sort of work. And if Mr. ACE is listening in, I'd really like to go to Sweden in the autumn for the salmon fishing. Okay, so here's uh, a sample that was taken, not by me, at another vet in Tasmania, at, uh, at uh, weaning in fact. So. Uh, we were really lucky that we got these results. Um, only 60% of the lambs that had been scanned, 60% uh, of the ewes that had been scanned in lamb actually lambed, but there were no frank abortions. Now, you know, the guy's pretty, uh, pretty diligent, so I don't think he was asleep on his watch. They just didn't lamb. So if we have a look down uh, this column here, you can see that, uh, you know, one in 40, one in 40, one in 40, all of those results are significant. So that's pretty uh, compelling information to suggest that uh, Campylobacter jejuni was the cause of abortion there. Um, on either side of it, fetus fetus is probably the most common cause of abortion. Uh, none of those results are significant. And if we look over here at uh, Toxoplasma, um, <clears throat> they've all of them got some sort of uh, ratio, but none of those are significant. So this is one case where we really hit the jackpot, and it's also one of the most spectacular cases that I've ever been involved in. So what diseases are we dealing with? Well, the two big ones are Campylobacter and Toxoplasmosis, and we're going to sp uh, speak in detail about those two. Other bacterial causes include uh, Listeria, Salmonella, Leptospira, and even Yersinia. Um, <clears throat> The reason I've got Listeria and Salmonella highlighted, I think, is I want to talk about those later. Leptospira is a very occasional cause. Yersinia, which is a cause of winter scours in the high rainfall areas. Yeah, look, it occurs, but uh, gee whiz, it's not going to be the end of the world. It's really presents as an abortion storm. Uh, viruses, pestivirus, hairy shaker disease or border disease. That's the equivalent of uh, bovine virus diarrhea as it occurs in sheep. And it's sort of the thing that gets you an HD in the exam questions um, if you're studying to be a vet, but uh, really it's pretty rare. Protozoa, uh, now Neospora is a disease primarily of cattle, and I'd say specifically of dairy cattle, although the, the beefies will probably jump up and down about that. Now, to the best of my knowledge, it's not been diagnosed or only rarely diagnosed in, um, in Australia. But the New Zealanders are taking a, uh, uh, an increasing interest in it. And the thing about uh, the Kiwis, of course, is that they're usually right. So when they say that they've got the best rugby team in the world, we should listen to them. Plants, um, not an infectious cause. I'll just make brief mention of two. Uh, onion grass, Romulus, is a Western District's uh, specialty. Uh, and that can cause frank abortions and you, you can see them. Um, and it also causes a, um, a neurological syndrome, a central nervous system syndrome. Clover infertility, I put up, up there with uh, lots and lots of question marks, primarily because clover infertility is not embryonic loss. It's really failure to get in lamb in the first place. And I really hope that we've got 
most of the issues with clover infertility sorted, even if you live in a place that uh, ends in up and you've got uh, a clover variety that ends in up. But you know, having said that, every so often we think that there might be an issue with clover, particularly after droughts break. It just seems that some of these uh, uh, old and superannuated strains of clover might be able to make a bit of a comeback after drought. So the diseases that we don't have in Australia, or actually we have at least one of these in Australia, but I'll just list them up here. Chlamydia, uh, enzootic abortion is a big issue in most parts of the world. Foot and mouth disease, Rift Valley fever, Q fever. Now Q fever is not exotic to Australia at all, but it's rarely if ever been um, uh, associated with uh, fetal loss or abortion. But what I'm gonna say is watch this space. It seems as if the, uh, the environments over which Q fever is ranging are moving more and more into the high rainfall area. It used to be a disease of cattle in the Gobi Desert, but uh, these days we see it um, uh, increasingly in a whole range of different ways in different places. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. And uh, I'd also encourage everybody to have their Q fever vaccination if you haven't already. Uh, and the exotic salmonellas, so by those I mean in fact um, two strains of salmonella, salmonella Brandenburg, which is a big issue in um, in New Zealand, and salmonella abortisovis, which is a big issue in many other parts of the world. And both of those uh, salmonellas are uh, not known in Australia, and they're abortion specific. Whoops, there. Okay, so what's important? So this is information that was uh, collected from our laboratory here in Tasmania, and it covered the period 2000 to 2010. Uh, and it showed in fact that the two types of um, Campylobacter, so Zizuni and Fetus Fetus, were the major contributors. Now, since 2010, uh, Campylobacter Fetus Fetus has probably been the uh, more important strain and worldwide it is still regarded as the more important strain. It's, a, it's abortion specific in sheep um, and uh, it's probably the most important. But uh, gee whiz, uh, in that period there, we saw lots and lots of Campylobacter and uh, our friend whose um, information I put up previously was also Campylobacter jejuni. So these guys here, Campylobacter species, they're just ones that they couldn't get a specific identity on. But you know, even if they're all fetus fetus, it still had jejuni. And overall, Campylobacter are the big ones. The second biggest one is uh, Toxoplasma. Um, and that's uh, received a lot of publicity in recent times. Uh, but these figures from Tasmania roughly uh, echo what has been seen in New Zealand in the last uh, 30 or so years, 30 or 40 years, in fact. Uh, except that the proportion of Toxoplasma to Campylobacter tends to go up and down a little bit. Um, Listeria, there's a few of those. Uh, since 2010, we've had some other odd balls like uh, um, uh, Yersinia. Don't worry too much about the names. But look over here in this right column, 21 of them undiagnosed. And that sort of shows the, the frustrating um, uh, lack of sort of success with this whole whole thing. I've got to say that uh, since about 2015, there's been lots more submissions to the lab purely and simply because sheep have been so valuable. Okay, so let's move on to Campylobacter abortion. So um, I really love this bacterium because uh, Tasmania has been the home of these enormous abortion storms. Um, you know, where you can literally lose 20 to 50%. Now, we've, we've not had many in the sort of 40 to 50% range for quite some years, but with uh, confinement feeding in the last uh, two or three years, we've certainly seen uh, quite a number of cases where there have been 20%, up to 20% loss, and certainly uh, even more cases where there's been sort of between five and 20%. And that's sort of frank abortions as opposed to sort of what it might've been lost earlier. Normally the abortion storm starts two to six weeks before lambing. The earlier they start, the greater potential for damage. The thing about it is that it's a real sleeper insofar as it's increasingly associated with scanned in lamb, but did not lamb, as per the slide that we showed where the guy had uh, Campylobacter jejuni. Um, and that can be anything from uh, a few percent up to sort of, uh, I've got 60% there, that's probably, uh, 
that's probably a bit of pub talk, but you know, that, that guy that we mentioned before, he had 40%. Um, <clears throat> occasionally associated with born alive, but not thrifty. So in fact, you know, in good weather and ewes that are milking like steam train, these lambs just decide uh, not to get up or go and hide under a bush and die. Um, and the advice with these ones is to keep checking closely for aborted lambs or small, normal dead lambs and submit them to the lab to try and get an answer. Um, in mobs with a, a history of abortion, uh, there can be inapparent background losses. So, and we're going to come back to that when we start talking about vaccination. Okay, so there's two possible causes, uh, Campylobacter fetus feces, that is abortion specific. Uh, it's probably a carrier status, and it's also believed that uh, it can spread between mobs by carrion eating birds and animals. So every time there's an outbreak of uh, Campylobacter, well, even, for, even if it's not diagnosed, it seems like the local crow population gets um, uh, absolutely uh, slaughtered by people thinking that they're the cause, but they're not the cause, but they possibly could spread it. The second one is Campylobacter jejuni. Now, this is usually a gut associated bacterium. Uh, the circumstances under which it becomes capable of abortion are really poorly understood. And worldwide, it is probably an emerging cause of abortion. So our Kiwi brethren tells us that it's really rare, but uh, here in Tassie and other parts of the high rainfall area in Australia, and even moving into the drier areas of Australia, we're starting to see more Campylobacter jejuni. Uh, right, so once an abortion occurs, it's likely that the sheep to sheep spread is via vaginal discharges and uh, by contact with aborted fetuses and placentas. Um, how the first cats get going uh, is not really well understood. And as I said, uh, carrion eating birds might spread it between mobs or between flocks. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So while the super big storms are associated with sheep that have not been exposed before, it's surprising when you go into mobs that, that you know, have got no history of abortion um, to see that uh, there's sort of some low level of serological response when you're investigating sort of a failure to lamb. So that suggests to me, in fact, that in many mobs, um, they may be circulating at a low level in what's basically immune flock, an immune flock, but causing background losses. And those losses can soon mount up. The thing to keep in mind is that uh, close contact facilitates spread. So uh, high stocking rate, controlled grazing, grain feeding, and particularly confinement feeding. They're the really big risk factors. Okay, and this last point is that uh, uh, generally speaking, we're talking about Campylobacter being a uh, disease of the high rainfall area, so Tasmania, southern, uh, southern um, Victoria, southeast of South Australia, and the high rainfall area in Western Australia. But it seems that the more we look, the more we find in far-flung places, and in particular, information back from uh, Coopers, who produced the vaccine, are suggesting that uh, Campylobacter jejuni may be a bit of an issue in the um, in the drier areas of the state, and it comes to the surface with confinement feeding. Okay, so there's not much point in putting up photos of aborted lambs uh, in this case because they just look like dead lambs. Um, for those of you that like to wield the knife or for the vets that are listening and have never seen it, this is the classic Campylobacter lesion. So these uh, white spots on the liver with a sort of a, a reddish pink area in the middle. And in my time in investigating the disease, including some uh, uh, outbreaks that have absolutely slaughtered farmers, I've seen this once. So. Uh, it's great to have the photo, but uh, it's certainly not um, not the be all and end all. And that photo is courtesy of our friend Dave West in his fine book on sheep diseases. So what to do in an outbreak? The first thing I'd say is get a diagnosis and submit those fresh fetuses. Uh, while you're waiting for the diagnosis, uh, and it usually can, you know, sort of a week turnaround, five day turnaround, 
Um, do three things, and these are really all very important. Pick up all the fetuses and membranes that you can, because that's probably where other sheep are going to to uh, contract it from. Uh, isolate the aborted ewes if possible, uh, and um, spread the sheep out if possible. So, in fact, in many of our um, abortion outbreaks, we actually suggest that people start putting uh, sheep onto their lambing paddocks in advance of when they might normally do so. Okay, so once you've got your diagnosis of Campy, um, keep on isolating and picking up. And I know it's a chore and fair dink, and when you see some of these big abortion storms, it's sort of like driving through a paddock that's had a, a hailstorm and some of the stones haven't melted yet. The major decision, uh, in fact, is whether to treat the whole mob with antibiotics. So I guess I'd say that every textbook since I was a kitty, which is long before Leonard Teal left homicide, says you know to treat them with an antibiotic, uh, a whole flock treatment. There's not a whole lot of evidence that it works. Uh, and uh, it, my personal experience is that it probably doesn't work, but I know other well-credentialed vets who would absolutely swear by it. Um, the additional comment is the further out from lambing, the more likely it is to work. So in fact, if you're six weeks out and you're picking up, you know, sort of 1% uh, uh, of fetuses a day, then the chances are that you're actually in front of the main part of the abortion storm. So if you are gonna pull the trigger on antibiotics, uh, that's when I, uh, they're the sort of flocks that I'd be uh, um, concentrating on. And um, there's a whole host of things that have been tried over the years. But uh, the two drugs that uh, I'm prepared to recommend are oxytetracycline and erythromycin. Um, <clears throat> if you go online, you'll find that the uh, Kiwis treat it with penicillin streptomycin combination, but that's not been uh, available in um, Australia for many years. It's uh, the bottom. Okay. Now, the final point we'd make is what to do with aborted use. And before we had the vaccine, in fact, what we used to do is identify those aborted ewes and then expose mobs where there hadn't been abortion or alternatively uh, uh, ewe lambs that had never been joined to those aborted ewes in the hope of getting some, some uh, immunity. And it works so-so. Um, part of the issue is in fact that uh, many of you would be aware of the repeatability of rearing failure. So you know whether you should keep these darlings to go around again is a little bit problematic. Uh, but I think if you've got a well-identified cause of um, uh, abortion, then there probably is worth uh, having them go around again, particularly since in the case of, um, of Campylobacter, um, they rarely, if ever, have huge amounts of infection in the, uh, in the uterus after, afterwards. And so the chances of them not getting in lamb because of residual infection um, is pretty low. Okay, so that's campy. No, it's not, of course it's not. Um, flock impact and prevention. So in abortion storms, we see 10 to 50%, 60% might be a bit of pub talk um, and more frequently 10 to 20%, but uh, heavens above in 30 years in Tasmania, I think we've probably had oh, 15 places that I can remember that would have had uh, better than 40%, a big loss. And that's right across the whole flock. Now, the in New Zealand's experience was that cases of abortion occurred about every six to seven years. So as the years got old and the immunity uh, started to wane in the flock, then you were ripe for another storm. That's not been my experience. So once you've had a, an abortion storm, the chances are that you're going to be fairly immune, fairly immune. Um, but we always should believe our Kiwi brethren. This is the really important thing, and that is that um, every New Zealand vet will tell you that there's a two to 5% improvement in conception rate in flocks that have not had a history of abortion but start to vaccinate, and five to 8% in flocks that have had a history of abortion but no visible abortions. So those sort of levels uh, of uh, background losses are the ones that I think uh, are worth uh, focusing on. Okay, so uh, risk assessment approach to vaccination. First comment I'd make is that seeing we've got access to vaccination, if you've had an abortion storm, I wouldn't be relying on 
uh, aborted ewes to vaccinate the rest of the flock. So uh, $1.40 a dose, $2.80 for maidens, and then $1.40 thereafter. So across the flock, that's, uh, unless you're starting everything from scratch, uh, year in, year out, that's about $1.60, depending on whether you keep them uh, to be five or six years of age. So in my opinion, vaccination is a no-brainer in high-risk situation, and these are the high risks. Recent history of abortion, uh, particularly if you've got a diagnosis, and just remember that any introduced sheep might be particularly prone. Confinement feeding, grain trails, particularly in the high rainfall area. So um, after some pretty horrible experiences uh, about four years ago, um, any of my clients that are confinement feeding uh, or in fact heavily feeding ewes are uh, recommended to vaccinate. And the other one is a serological evidence to, so blood test evidence to back up a big difference between scandal marked in lamb. Okay, so the next level of risk is um, if you've got a big difference between scanned and marked with no evidence uh, of another cause. So you either failed to get the bloods or the bloods were equivocal. Uh, it's still probably worth trying vaccination. And even without any of those things, I think there's a reasonable case that prime land producers using high intensity grazing systems should consider vaccination as a routine. <coughs> okay, so that leads us to the vaccination regimes. The company recommends two in the first year and then an annual booster. Uh, the timing is uh, uh, for naive sheep, um, first shot in advance of, um, of joining, and the second shot, well, probably no later than sort of about uh, the first one third of, um, of the pregnancy. Across the mob, that comes to about a buck sixty a year. So look, this is really rough and back of the envelope and everything like that. But uh, across a whole mob, even if you're going the, the full Monty vaccination program, that's about 1% additional lambs uh, to break even. Now, I know that that can be criticized on the grounds that you might have better uses for that money, uh, but really a buck 60 uh, per year across the mob is not gonna make a huge difference in terms of things like um, supplementary feeding. Uh, so uh, if a dollar sixty is too much, then I'm assuming that you're spending it, in fact, on things like new kitchens or salmon fishing holidays in Norway. So lots of people both here and in New Zealand say, well, you know, it's only the maidens that get affected, so we're only going to do the maidens. Now, there's no doubt that, um, that the maidens are the most likely to be uh, absolutely slaughtered. But we've seen enough cases where, in fact, there are these background losses in older age groups and, in fact, abortion storms in older age groups to, for me to suggest, in fact, that that's probably not a really good option. Probably not a really good option. So the third approach is what we can call Nylon's approach. And it's an intermediate approach. And uh, I'm not going to actually write down what it is because I might get sued by the company, but it's simply this. There's a deal of evidence to show that the vaccinal immunity is pretty robust. So if I'm having trouble convincing a client to do it every year, uh, then I say, well, do your maidens and then have a, a booster at least once through their lifetime. So if you're keeping them for sort of uh, five years, then probably at um, there's three-year-olds, keep them for six years, four-year-olds. And look, that's not fallen in a heap, but you know that's, that's my approach. And um, if I was asked, did I recommend this? I deny it greatly. Okay, so let's move on to Toxo. It's the number two cause of abortion of sheep in Australia, New Zealand, probably South Africa as well, and nobody else matters. Now, because the life cycle involves feral cats, its impact is overrated. By which I mean, in fact, as soon as people see abortions, they say it's got to be the cats. And so uh, bejesus and fur is blown out of the cats and it may not even be uh, toxoplasma. The other comment I'd make is that um, the worst cases of abortion that I've seen due to toxo have been in the region of about 25 to 30% in one age group, and that's usually the youngest age group. Um, so two to 8%, oh, 
in fact, it's frequently less than 2%. Um, but like Campylobacter, it can also be a cause of these unsort of speci unspecified background losses. Um, occasionally up to 15%, we have seen it higher in, in young sheep or specifically one-year-old ewes. And the reason that the one-year-olds are so important is that there's, in the high rainfall areas, there's a really good chance that they're gonna be exposed naturally at some stage during their lives and they'll actually become immune. And so if you've only got one-year-old ewes, then the chances are that they've got less chance of becoming immune. So this hor horrible graphic shows us the life cycle uh, and that is that uh, young cats, um, starting in this section here, uh, shed millions and millions of oasis. Their, their capacity to contaminate pasture and grain bins or hay is absolutely enormous. And then uh, that uh, those eggs, oasis are eaten, they've got a kangaroo there, at least I presume it's a kangaroo, but you know more likely lizards, birds, rodents, or something like that, and sheep. And if sheep eat it at the right time, it can cause abortion and the right time is pretty much any stage through pregnancy. Uh, the life cycle's completed when the cat actually scavenges an animal that's got the muscles um, in cystic form in, in, their, uh, in them. So mostly we think that the cats become uh, reinfected or young cats become reinfected when they sort of scavenge mice or bit lizards and uh, birds as the cause. So this is a graphic from South Australia. So I'm not sure whether their kangaroos are particularly small uh, or their cats particularly large, but um, at any rate, yeah, actually just mentioned that uh, toxoplasma is an increasing issue in, in wildlife and in kangaroos, it causes this uh, wonderful sort of uh, staring into space syndrome. So kangaroos in the top paddock with kangaroos in the top paddock. Okay, so young cats are the culprits and they can contaminate like nothing else. Um, We've covered that, we've covered that. It's mostly a disease of cool, wet climates. So the survivability of the oocyst is really short in the Gobi Desert, but uh, in Southern areas, uh, they can survive months to years. And so the environment may remain contaminated. And I'll go out on the limb and say, it's mostly a condition of younger sheep. Well, that's where we see our largest losses. Okay, so like camping, Toxo can cause issues all through the pregnancy. So if they're infected early in pregnancy, you may get resorption. Uh, so you're looking for low conception rates or differences between scanning and marking. Ask the scanner what he's seeing, because a lot of the time, you know, the scanners can pick up that the fetuses don't look normal. Um, and so that's forewarning that something's gonna happen. Uh, if you get uh, mid-pregnancy, um, Infection, you can get uh, mummification and abortion, and then as you move towards the uh, the end, you get more and more cases of abortion. Uh, and in any outbreak, in fact, you can have a range of signs. And this <coughs> goes to the fact that uh, toxo causes abortion in uh, um, uh, by contaminated pasture or contaminated feed sources. And in fact, um, uh, that can occur at any stage during pregnancy. The thing to keep in mind is that toxo causes necrotic, disgusting, manky abortion or uh, mummified fetuses. So if you're seeing lots of those, there's much more chance that it's toxo. And that also goes to the fact that uh, if you have had an outbreak of toxo and you've identified a ewes that have been, uh, that have aborted, they are a much poorer risk in terms of getting back in land because they're more likely to have um, a residual metritis or infection in the uterus. So uh, serology, bit of an aid, PM on multiple fetuses is the way to go. And why do we worry about the PMs? Well, in, in case it's campy, we're gonna keep, pick up the fetuses. If it's toxo, there's no point in picking up the fetuses or isolating the use. Okay, so a uh, picture again from our friend Dave West in New Zealand, and you can see what I mean by a manky abortion. Um, so we've actually got uh, pairs here. So the, the big one up the top is a, is a single, uh, but the other ones are all pairs. No, in fact, they're all pairs. Uh, and in fact, you can see, and we see this with some regularity, this is sort of almost a normal lamb. This one is really small. This one could have even been born alive. That one there is uh, an absolute shocker. Um, right, and 
the diagnostic criteria for any vet that might be listening is you've got uh, a horrible placenta with lots of little white spots on it. And you do actually see that with some frequency. And it reiterates the fact that when you want to, uh, you want to get a diagnosis, make sure you submit the placenta if you possibly can. Right, so we've got to get a diagnosis. You're sick of me hearing say that. Thing is, there's no point in isolating the ewes um, if, uh, if it is uh, toxo because it's not spread from sheep to sheep. So let's quickly move on to uh, prevention. It's mostly a disease of young sheep. Um, and I'm gonna say, just be careful about imported sheep because it's primarily a disease of the high rainfall areas. So if you're in the habit of bringing in um, any number of sheep from the drier uh, parts to uh, replenish your flock, those animals could be in fact pretty much totally naive. And so they, they are a high risk. Uh, there's no vaccine available in Australia. There is one in New Zealand and it's unlikely to be available in Australia at any time in the foreseeable future. So you can try and expose young ewes to likely sources of infection. So, uh, here in Tassie, you know, uh, we've tried things like running them next to the tip uh, or running them along hedgerows. I mean, that's a favoured place for um, for um, uh, cats to hide um, or running them close to other places that cats hide like hay sheds. How effective it is, look, I've got no information, but I don't think it's very effective. The real biggie, in fact, is don't feed uh, grain from uncovered bins, only from silos. Um, and same goes for hay. Uh, any sort of open hay in a haystack uh, is likely to be infected by cats. And it also raises the question why you need to feed hay at all, but that's for the next seminar. <coughs> now there is a drug called amprolium. So if you get touched up year by year, um, we can uh, provide you with references on uh, how to reduce the risk of by feeding these animals amprolium. To the best of my knowledge, uh, it's not been widely practiced in Australia. In fact, I don't know of anybody who's done it. Right, so the other biggie in fact is cat control. So everybody gets really enthusiastic about um, blasting the bejesus out of the cats. It's really a doubtful proposition. And the thing is that in fact, if you try and reduce the cat population holus bolus, uh, then the chances are you're going to be taking out lots of uh, older cats that are not any longer shedding and um, just opening up for younger cats to come in and fill the gap. And it's those younger cats that are actually likely to be the, um, the causes of, uh, of the contamination. So unless you can uh, guarantee that you're going to get uh, uh, make a huge impact on the cat population. I don't think it works all that well. You might decide to control the cat population for a whole host of other reasons, and that's fine. But just don't expect it to make much difference to your um, toxoplasma. Okay, so last lap, and I know I've gone over time, so Hillary's going to be uh, just about ready to choke me. Um, listeriosis, a rare cause of abortion. It's mostly associated with feeding spoiled silage. Um, so if you see cases of abortion and cases of circling disease, that's most likely what it is. So they just stand there and walk in circles. Um, the reason I've put it up there is that we really need to differentiate it from salmonellosis. So salmonella, uh, we don't have the strains that cause uh, um, large scale abortion outbreaks such as uh, Abortosovis or Brandenburg. But if we have systemic salmonellosis, you may get abortion as part of that. So if you've got U deaths plus or minus diarrhea plus or minus abortion, it's really important to get a diagnosis because in fact, salmonella is a pretty serious uh, human health risk. And you've got to decide, in fact, again, whether you go for a whole flock treatment with, um, with antibiotics, or in fact, whether you just spread them out uh, and hope that it runs its course. But uh, yeah, uh, take advice on the whole flock treatment. Okay, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, please raise any points that you'd like. But just to recap re briefly, reproductive failure uh, can present as a poor concept, which can rate embryonic loss, frank abortion, or birth of, of, of ill thrifty lambs. 
So use all data sources that you can to uh, try and investigate these issues. And keep in mind, in fact, that the background losses are more likely to be of uh, consequence than the sort of abortion storm. <coughs> Back up your um, information. Please get postmortems done because um, at the very least, we don't want uh, uh, water supplies and other things um, contaminated with salmonellosis, with salmonella, I'm sorry. Um, Campylobacter, we have a vaccine. Um, I don't know what the sales are like, that's not my business, but uh, use it on a risk-based approach. So if you live in the Gobi Desert and you've never seen a case of abortion, it's probably not a goer. At the other extreme, if you're in a controlled grazing um, scheme in the high rainfall, zone, it probably is. No vaccine for toxoplasma, uh, just avoid the contaminated feeds. Other causes of abortion are pretty rare, but get them diagnosed whenever you can. Thank you. All right, thanks Paul. I think you made a pretty good case for your trip to Norway just then, so good luck with that. Um, I'll just give Paul a little bit of a break. Um, thanks everybody who've sent through your questions so far. Um, please get them in as soon as possible so I can relay them to uh, Paul and we can um, get into question time. If you do have to leave now, um, please make sure you take the time to fill out the survey that will pop up when you exit out of the webinar platform. Um, this survey feedback comes back to us at home circuit, it goes to MLA and to presenters like Paul, just to make sure that um, the webinars are hitting the nail on the head and, and any extra information that you might require and how we can set up webinars in the future to address those, um, those issues. Okay, Paul, we'll get on to some questions now. I think um, as a few of them were coming through, you, you did answer them, but we might just go through, um, if you could just um, briefly summarise, if you did. One from Frank, are there specific um, pasture conditions that predispose sheep to the problems um, being dis discussed? For example, monocultures, ultra short ground feed conditions or other pasture conditions? Okay. Uh, look, in, in broad terms, two comments, um, uh, abundance and absolutely nothing. So, uh, well, first of all, we'll say that, that toxo um, is independent of the pasture conditions, except insofar as to say that the survival on the pasture of toxo is, um, is longest in cool, moist conditions. But, uh, most of the cases of abortion with toxo are believed to be associated with feeding contaminated feeds. So uh, grain bins that uh, haven't got a top on them and uh, cats uh, defecate in them, but particularly hay, uh, they're the two big causes. So direct contamination from pasture, yep, it occurs, and we've seen uh, we've seen a couple of um, a couple of cases where, um, uh, in fact different mobs of sheep came through the same paddock, which was close to the road uh, and had a hedgerow. And these different mobs were boarded at slightly different times. So that's toxo. Now, for Campylobacter, the uh, rule is either lots of or nothing at all. So lots of uh, pasture uh, in those situations, um, in fact, you're more likely to be using a controlled or a really tight grazing system. <clears throat> I mean, you know, if you've had a freak, uh, a freak winter or spring, it's, it's different. But uh, yeah, if you've got the high concentrated rotational grazing system is one big determinant. In fact, the first importation of vaccine into Australia was done by the practice that I first worked for here. And that was done in the 1980s. Uh, and that's when everybody was switching over to control grazing schemes. The other side of the coin, in fact, is uh, where there's absolutely nothing. Uh, and of course, that means that you're supplementing with grain and or confinement feeding. Uh, and in those situations, particularly confinement feeding, but also you know, along the grain trails, um, there is a radically increased risk of um, abortion spreading and creating an abortion storm. But there's nothing inherent in the pasture per se which favours um, 
survival of the bacterium or spread of the bacterium, it's really uh, what, what the sheep are doing because of either too much or too little. I hope that helps. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the question, Frank. Uh, the next one is from Steve. Uh, I think you might have had a slide on this one, possibly. If we have positive results for Campy looking holistically, can we get it under control with management? Are we pushing the system too hard joining new lambs before they're exposed naturally or split lambing with supplement feeding, allowing us to stay in one paddock for longer than we should? Or have oh. we oversimplified the diversity in our soil microbiome? Oh, okay. Um, how am I going to answer that? It's possible that there is a philosophical difference between what I write, I might recommend and what um, our questioner is is suggesting, and that is that we're pushing the system too hard. So. When we're talking specifically about campy, um, you know, there's always going to be situations, even with modest stocking rates, where your sheep are at risk. So the season fails and you've either got to decide to destock or to feed them. And I mean, I think we can put forward a whole host of arguments that uh, you might be better off to feed them. And that creates a risk situation. The more general point that I would make, in fact, is that even if your production system uh, sort of stacks up a few of the risk factors for um, uh, an outbreak of Campylobacter, so for example, you run fairly high stocking rates, so you're more likely to, to um, have them in confinement feeding or on supplementary feeding, but in the normal run of years, uh, you've actually got, um, you know, uh, lots of pasture which you control with a, a high intensity controlled grazing system, then even under that situation, we do have a really robust uh, preventive in the form of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And um, the, you know, the, the vaccine, vaccination is, is cost effective. Uh, the only thing we don't know in the, in the, uh, the vaccination equation, in fact, is what's the real likelihood that you're actually losing sort of 2% due to background losses or 5 to 8%. And that's without sort of going down the pathway of all, you know, what about the risk of a, of a real uh, breakdown? So, you know, I think that that, that on the whole, uh, and I'm making assumptions about the, the question is sort of where, where the question is coming from, but I think that, you know, vaccination is, um, a reliable, uh, environmentally friendly and ethical way of controlling the disease, preventing the disease, I'm sorry. You think that helps? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think so. Steve, if you have a further question, please let us know. Uh, the next one is from Joe. Um, Paul, Campivax label says for unvaccinated use, two injections are due for uh -huh. joining. But can uh -huh. the second uh, injection be done after joining? Paul? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, uh, I'll go out on the limb here and say that uh, what I recommend and what the label recommends might be um, slightly different. But in the best of all possible worlds, I think we probably have two vaccines in before joining, and that means you get um, protection all through, you know, good protection all through pregnancy. However, uh, as the label said, if you give one shot before um, uh, before joining and one shot in the early stage of pregnancy, you're still going to get really good cover, and in all likelihood, um, it is more. I mean. We know that it can infect um, the U at any stage of the pregnancy, but it seems as if most of the infections, whether they present as frank abortions or just, uh, uh, you know, failure to lamb, most of the uh, issues occur in the second half of pregnancy. Uh, and the reason that we know that, in fact, is that it is relatively rare to actually identify. In fact, I don't think I've ever done it. I don't know if other vets have to identify campy as a cause of a poor, a poor conception rate when they're scanned at say six to seven weeks. So either or is fine. 
Thanks, Paul. Uh, the next question from DJ, can you scan use again in the last few weeks of pregnancy to see for dead fetuses and blood test those used? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, it's, it's going to work in a situation where they've been previously scanned. And in fact, uh, you are, um, you know, for whatever reason, you suspect a lot of them might have either slipped in apparently or been resorbed or whatever. Uh, and those animals make really good targets for serology. However, um, provided your scanner is up to speed, and I'm sure that most of them are these days, in fact, you can identify those sheep just by looking at them. You know, you uh, within sort of two to three weeks of, of um, of uh, lambing, you've got a really good idea which ones are pregnant and which are not. So uh, not trying to do the scanners out of a job and they're probably sitting around in the pub waiting for work to come in at the, uh, outside their normal season, but really probably doesn't uh, produce a whole lot that you can't do by another means. And uh, the additional problem is twofold, additional problems are twofold. Firstly, you know, uh, running sheep through the yards uh, just for that is probably an unnecessary stressor. And secondly, if there is an issue there, uh, it's just possible that uh, a, a, an extra yarding rather than one that's involved with uh, pre lambing treatments uh, might just be spreading the disease as well. So probably not, yes, you could, probably not necessarily, uh, not necessary, you can do it other ways and maybe actually counterproductive. Yeah. Uh, so the next question from Tom, sorry if I mispronounce this, is serology useful for listeriosis as well? Is what uh, useful for listeriosis? I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to make me say it again. <laughs> um, serology. Yes, I'm just being urology. <laughs> U-R-O-L-O-G-Y. -O -O S-E-R-O-L-O-G-Y. Why did you put it in here? Uh, no, I'm not even sure what that is. I'm sorry. Maybe Tom could get back to us with a with a, an updated question, and I'll try and answer. All right. If you could, Tom, that'd be great. Uh, Daniel, I would like to know: Is there any evidence of lepto abortions in sheep? Oh yes. Okay. Really good question. Um, uh, um, it's diagnosed in Australia rarely, um, and it's interesting that it's not diagnosed more frequently because when you do zero surveys it's uh, pretty obvious that sheep can um, uh, contract lepto and, and they zero convert. Um, the our Kiwi brethren, uh, God bless them, are getting more and more interested in it and um, although it's not featured tonight, uh, I think that uh, the crew in Western Australia are looking at this and probably giving consideration to it. So going back to uh, that table that I presented on the, uh, the causes of abortion in Tasmania, I think there was sort of one case diagnosed as lepto, but the lab keeps looking. So it's really rare, but uh, we don't know what its involvement is in these sort of background losses. Okay, thanks. I I can see what Tom is talking about here, Paul. Um, your your tests, your laboratory tests. Uh, oh, just I'm sorry. Just repeat the question. It's two minutes ago. My memory's just not that good. <laughs> oh, um, you're gonna make me say it again. <laughs> is serology useful for listening? Oh, serology. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, okay. You, I, you. I don't know now. <laughs> Okay, uh, look, generally not, generally not. So, um, well, actually, I've said that with great confidence. I'm not aware. I mean, one of the flocks that we work with is a serum harvesting crew, um, and we've we've submitted lots of cases for listeria, and there's never been a commentary about the serology. So, um, in general terms, no, I don't think it is. Okay, thank you. I've been out of uni too yeah. long. But I just, uh, yeah, I just wouldn't expect it to be a large scale issue unless you're feeding pit silage. Uh, so uh, in my time here and in other parts of Australia, but here in Tassie, I've seen one large scale outbreak due to listeria and that was feeding uh, spoiled silage 
And in that same outbreak, there were hundreds of sheep dying with circling disease, which is a, <coughs> a neurological disease <coughs> caused okay. by listeria. Thanks, Paul. Uh, the next uh, question from Mark. If Campy's Jejuni is a normal gut inhabitant, what criteria do you use to decipher between background normal exposure and being the cause of the abortion problem? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it goes to the whole notion of untangling uh, or using serology um, at all. Okay, so uh, the first comment is, you know, you've got to have uh, a, uh, either evidence of uh, fetal loss. So, you know, use scans that haven't lambed or are unlikely to lamb. Um, and the second or, or, and or frank abortions. So if you've got frank abortions and they, they diagnose uh, Campylobacter jejuni, then they are able to sort of sort out, I'm uh, sorry, Campylobacter, they are able to sort out whether it's jejuni or fetus fetus or very, very occasionally another one called Campylobacter coli. So frank abortion is easy. With, with the, um, with the uh, background losses, um, it's much more problematic. So, you know, if you've got background losses and you identify sheep that um, have not lambed or uh, you believe they haven't lambed and you take samples from them and they're sort of consistently above that one in 20 level, maybe not all of them would be, uh, and the sheep that you sample that have lambed basically have no uh, background teeters, you can be reasonably confident that that's the cause. But when all said and done, it's still sort of a little bit of a leap of faith. So um, it's not an easy one to sort out. And we sort of, we mix um, sort of science and, uh, and uh, dark arts in equal part when we're making determinations on that. All right, thanks Paul. I'm just reading through the next few. Uh, Caroline says, great talk, Paul. Um, do you know if the TASI lab screen cases for Neospora? Uh, they will on request. They will on request. Um, so I tend to, to ask them to, other, other labs may not. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks. Um, so just a further question from Steve, who asked about the um, holistic management before. Yes. Says, Thanks, Paul. Yes. That really helps. Is anyone working on the soil microbiome, the more life in the soil with plant symbiotic bacteria, the less space for other nasties, generally facultative anaerobes? That's a hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, the answer is in terms of, um, in terms of, our aborting diseases and specifically Campylobacter, not that I'm aware of. Um, the point that I would make is that given um, that the disease tends to be transmitted animal to animal, at least we believe so, from um, uh, you know uh, abortion discharges, even if they're not apparent, or uh, alternatively aborted fetuses and um, a placenta, I think it highly unlikely that, that, that those factors that Steve has raised would um, bring us a great deal of joy. All right. Thanks for that, Steve. Um, that seems to be all for the questions tonight, unless someone gets one in really quickly. Those of you who are asking, these webinars are recorded and they are available on the MLA website uh, under extension resources, um, I believe. If you need to find it, just email me and I can forward you the link. Uh, so I'd just like to thank Paul um, for tonight's presentation and for staying on and um, fielding a few of those um, questions. They were really good questions tonight. Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in and, and thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you and I'm sorry I talked too much. <laughs> All right, thanks.